Welcome back to the Money and Wealth Show. I'm Sterling Fox. Our special guest this week is cross-border investment specialist Dan Walco from Seabank Capital Management in South Surrey, White Rock. And Dan, over the summer on this program, we were privileged to interview some very interesting characters from around the planet, many of whom uh, the common denominator is what I'm getting at here was advising us to reconsider our attachment to the U.S. marketplace, suggesting there are other places in the world that might offer the same sort of interest. And they took great issue with the politics of the Obama administration and don't think that bodes well for the U.S. marketplace. Right. What do you make of all that? What do you see down the road, Obama or not? Well, it's a valid point. I wouldn't be that bearish and extreme about it, Sterling. I, I think um, there are negative factors and there are positive factors. I mean, obviously, there's a tax regime coming in next year that the Obama administration is uh, pushing forward, and uh, we're, uh, a bump up in capital gains tax, so the taxation environment and headwinds will be more onerous. Arguably, given the negative sentiment out there, and certainly what I research and read, the, the sentiment has become somewhat extreme. It is my contention in the marketplace that a lot of these things are well discounted into, into the price of the market. Okay. In fact, I would suggest that, that because the current opinion is public knowledge and it's well known that the stock market's actually discounted a lot of that negative sentiment already. Uh, and as a consequence, the market, I think it, perhaps this is the issue best way explained, is that the stock market and the economy are two different things. Okay. The stock market and stock prices typically tend to uh, discount economic issues well in advance of the actual event. Some say averaging about six months. Six to nine months. Okay. There's lead and lag times, it's not perfect, and so forth and so on. So. I think it's fair to say if it's, so, so for example, everybody knows we're going to have a large, or an increase in capital gains taxes in the United States. That's factored into the market. I, I don't necessarily agree with the commentators. I would be somewhat more bullish. I think that a lot of it has already been discounted depending on sectors. Uh, I think there are selected sectors that are a great value in the United States. And I don't think you can paint it with a broad brush. Okay, and I think a lot of that animosity yeah. towards the U.S. marketplace is specifically aimed at the economic policies of the, administ the current, administration. current administration. And uh, come November, uh, we may see some changes in that dynamic, and that's Precisely. only a few weeks away. Well, you know, a classic example, when Obama came in with the health care issue and, and the bill, which was passed, there was huge negative sentiment about the American health care industry going to, you know, down and never recovering. Right. Well, guess what? It's recovering just fine. And there are great investment opportunities to make money in the American healthcare business. Uh, it's same thing. So I guess when I see collective sentiment, such as you're suggesting was the case over the summer here of 2010, I tend to discount that somewhat. Um, possible. You know, it's always possible. But it's also not a bad thing for North Americans to be perhaps a little more aware of the rest of the world out There's there. There's no question, but you know, be, be, be quite frank, I mean, over the last 10 years, we manage money, as you know, globally mm -hmm. in the United States and Canada. And often, and historically, we used to position Canadian portfolios with a segment of, of American stocks um, for the diversification reasons. I mean, you don't have a healthcare business to speak of in Canada, for example, so you'd want to own some U.S. healthcare stocks. But the currency has been against you for almost 10 years now. You know, we had a 62 cent dollar way back when. Now we're almost par again. Uh, so the headwinds have been somewhat negative for Canadian investors going through and investing in U.S. dollars. Let, let me pick up on that because you, you mentioned just before we, we started this program today, uh, we were talking about at the beginning of September how gold was in near record mm -hmm. territory. And you said, but hey, you know, do, a, do some currency conversions and look back historically. Right. It's not as high as perhaps it's being cracked up to be in the newspapers. Tell us about that. Well, it's the current generation. I mean, if you, I started in the business. I mean, I'll tell you how, it'll tell you how old I am. But uh, I started in the business in 1979, right in the back era of the oil and gas business was um, a big deal. And gold went to $840 an ounce in 1981. Well, I knew it was the top the day this lady walked into my office. And she said she'd gone to the Bank of Nova Scotia. She borrowed $100,000, 90% of her mortgage, and she wanted to invest in gold. 
we're done. Right. That was it. When you deflate gold back to those dollars and so forth, gold can go substantially higher. We're nowhere near there yet. And what would then, all those mathematical considerations taken in, what would an all-time high for gold look like in this fall of 2010? Well, I don't think it's going to take time. I mean, we have, you know, I, I would suggest we could, over the next five to ten years, gold could double from here. Okay. Um, and the re simple reason is, 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 a, uh, is that all the world has to recapitalize this debt, right, that's being expended and so forth. As you probably know, there's only three ways they can do it. They can borrow, the American government can borrow the money, they can, they can um, uh, tax it, or they can print it. Mm -hmm. So we're going to, and that's true of your Option three seems to be at play the well, most right now. Well, it's the same with Europeans and so forth. Sure. There's, if people think there's a lot of money printing now, maybe being printed now, let me suggest this. They ain't seen nothing yet. Do you mean there's, there's more to come? How else are you going to do it? Okay. Well, I don't know whether that's a good thing to look <laughs> forward to or not, Dan, but it's certainly not going to be dull. Sterling, we've been through it before. Rising inflation because of money supply. The problem isn't, without getting technical, and I know our time is limited, but they're printing the money. The problem is there's no problem with the monetary supply. It's the velocity of money. Like you see, people aren't borrowing and lending and churning that money around in the economy. So the next step these governments will take will be measures to amplify the velocity of money. Lots of money being printed, but nobody's doing anything with it. Sure. But hoarding it. So they've got to get it moved, and, and they will address it. Our special guest this week on the Money and Wealth Show has been international cross-border money manager Dan Walco from Seabank Capital Management in South Surrey, White Rock. Mr. Walco, Dan, thanks so much for joining us, sir. My A pleasure, A most Sterling. informative conversation. We'll, help, we'll have you back. For sure. And we'll be right back. Good afternoon. My name is Larry Ray. I'm the chairman and CEO of Mollycore Gold Corp. As the name states, we do have a deposit we're developing in British Columbia, which is a pure molybdenum deposit. But our focus these days is on magnesium in Nevada. Through serendipity, we discovered a large deposit of magnesium running about 10% with a high purity and consists of about 256 million tonnies at this time, 52 billion pounds. Our main emphasis is to move this project forward by beginning a drill program later this year in which we can increase the integrity of the resources into the indicated and inferred as well as increase the resource itself. For further information, please visit our website at mollycore.com or phone us at 604-531. 9639 Tax Tips with David Ingram Hey, you're a snowbird. You go down to Arizona or California or Florida for the weekend, maybe Corpus Christi, Texas. If you're down there more than 120 days a year, three years in a row, you end up with what's called the substantial presence test. And you have to file a U.S. tax return, 1040 NR, and you have to file a Form 8840 to tell them that you have a closer connection to Canada. The rule is not 183 days for snowbirds. It's 120 days. Check it out with a competent advisor. Get your tax returns done so that the IRS doesn't come back at you four years later and say, do them all at once. That's a tax tip. And that's our program for this week. Our thanks to David Ingram and to our special guest, Dan Walco. And thank you for joining us. If you have some thoughts about today's show that you'd like to share with us, please send them along to comments at themoneyandwealthshow.com. I'm Sterling Fox. See you next time.